great profile of Dr. Lim. Dr. Lim Tuck Ming was born in George Tong Penang in 1964. He took refuge in the Triple Gem with the late Venerable Chok Mo as a certified master and preceptor in 1979. To commemorate this occasion, he was given the Dhamma name of Chita Prabha or Sing Kuang in Chinese. Since then, Dr. Lim has been very active in Buddhist activities in schools, universities, and Buddhist associations. He has special interest in the area of Buddhist history, values of Buddhist practices, and meditation. Academically, the of destination is on your right. <laughs> Academically, he obtained his bachelor's degree in science, education, majoring in chemistry, minoring in physics from the University of Bayer in 1989. Subsequently, he received his, his continuous tertiary education in the same university to a doctorate degree in organic chemistry. Dr. Lin is a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry in the UK since 2014 and a panel member of the Malaysian Qualifications as Agency for the Accreditation of Chemistry Programs in Malaysian Universities. He is currently the Dean of the Faculty of Science, University to go up the Raman. Let's give a big hand to Dr. Lin. Hmm. Thank you for the introduction. A very good morning to brothers and sisters today. I'm very happy to be here to share with you my little bit understanding about faith. Uh, the pictures that I have picked is to show various lotuses, various colors. And interestingly, the Indians they actually have a different name for different color of the lotus. You know, unlike uh, Chinese or, or English, they have only one name for the lotus. But the Indians, as you can see for the different color, if you want to uh, pinpoint a specific lotus, then you will call a different name and they will know which lotus you are referring to. So the topic I would like to discuss today is on faith. As you might have noticed from friends or relatives, different people will perceive faith differently. Some take it as a personal perseverance in life. Some take it as a community activities. Faith as a community activities, and some others go one step further as the state activities, which will be <clears throat> guided or monitored by certain authorities. So, of course, uh, we have a different understanding of faith. So, today our focus will be how Buddhists look at faith or I should say that what Buddhists or how we should look at faith in the Buddhist perspective according to the Dhamma. So I have uh, roughly divided this discussion into first we will talk a little bit of faith and then we look into, because faith is directly connected to belief. So we will talk a little bit about the common or general belief of Buddhists, irrespective of traditions. And then we will move on to look at how faith is connected to cultivation, or how Buddhists elevate the belief into a practice, a cultivation. And then uh, I will summarize for the important point of this discussion. So this is roughly how we will uh, look at this topic. The examples I've given just now about faith, we can see from other religions or beliefs. Actually, faith is not only about religion. 
there are people who believe in certain philosophies, socialism, communism, and so on. They also develop their faith in that thinking. So not only religious thinking, but also some philosophical thinking. But in Buddhism, when we talk about faith, the Pali term is sada, or the Sanskrit srada. Actually, very interestingly, this srada in Hinduism, because we know that uh, Buddhism actually started in India, so they do have very common terms used by uh, different systems. So the Srada, understood by the Indians, the Hindus, is actually a religious practice of offering to the ancestors. But in Buddhism, we are not talking about just belief, but it is a faith or confidence that develops as a conviction towards something which you value. Not, not just a mere belief, but you have conviction into something that you think has values or will help you. And sometimes this belief, why we call it some kind of confidence or faith, because we may not have reached that stage, but we have confidence that it is real, or eventually we will reach that stage. Although today or at the present moment, we might not have reached that stage, but there are other people who have reached that stage and either proven to us that it is real and not just mere belief. So that is why we say that belief in something beyond the present spiritual attainment, your present spiritual attainment, we know as a mundane human being, there are many, many stages which we have not achieved not achieved doesn't mean cannot be achieved. So this faith stress on the right belief. When we say right belief, then that belief is not any belief. It must have certain characteristics. And that characteristic has to do with consistency. Consistency means in the past, it was like that or manifest in that way. Presently, you see it like that and in future, it will be like that. If something has this character, then we say that it suits our belief and we have confidence in that. So you can make use of this first character on the consistency to try to match the things that you know and see whether it stands the first test or not for your belief. Consistency means in the past it was like that, now you see it like that and in future it will still be like that. This is the first test of whatever you believe. Then the second one, we say necessary. Necessary means it has its own natural way or systems. And this system is not governed or controlled by a supernatural power. Meaning that with or without that supernatural power, it was like that, it is like that, it will be like that. So we say that it has this necessary characteristic. I give you a simple example. Well, if you have an object without support, 
and you let the object stays in the air without support. So the natural tendency or necessarily it will just drop. So that is the necessary nature. Of course, in science, we say that gravity is attracted by gravity. So in all necessary happenings in nature, there is some kind of explanation. However, we may not have understood or unraveled all the natural explanation. So again, that's why I mentioned just now about that faith, that confidence. So this is the second character that we can use to check some matters of belief, whether it is necessary behaving in a certain matter, certain way. And thirdly, universal. Universal here is irrespective of where. It shows the same character, meaning that it should not be different in the North Pole or in the South Pole. It should not be different in a country or in another country. Then it has this universal character. So anything that passes these three important tests, you can believe it. So <clears throat> we now move on to <clears throat> more interesting <clears throat> topics or discussions about Buddhism. And these are the common belief of Buddhists irrespective of traditions, whether Mahayana, Vajrayana, Theravada, or whatever, a different development of the original Indian Buddhism. We all should know or accept. If you don't accept, that means something must be wrong. So let us uh, look at this closely and more carefully, you may have a different thinking from mine, doesn't matter. Because uh, in Buddhism, we always discuss to enhance the understanding and then to find out more about uh, Buddhism itself. So what are some of the common things that Buddhists believe? The late Chief Reverend wrote a book, What Buddhists Believe. So in that book, there are many, many matters brought up and he explained to new Buddhists about uh, what Buddhists believe in the perspective of Theravada. But I have selected the common belief of all traditions, irrespective of Mahayana or Theravada. This is very important. Gonaka Mungalana Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya, Sutta number 107. What is important here? I call this the proclamation of faith. Because I choose this sutta to prove one point. Uh, this is very straightforward. The, when, when, uh, during the Buddha's time, when he discussed certain topics, the discourses with the disciples, listeners, and some of them at that particular moment was filled with joy. Excellent, good Gotama. Now, the translation of excellent is actually sadhu. So that is why uh, <clears throat> in Buddhist activities, you keep on hearing uh, Buddhists chanting sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Actually, it just means very good, excellent, very good, very good. This is how we express 
our happiness. And then you pay attention to what this Gonaka Mungalana, this particular person, said. I take refuge in good Gotama, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. May good Gotama accept me as a lay devotee who has taken refuge from today onwards till the end of my life. So there are two things here. Accept me as a lay devotee till the end of my life. So this is the <clears throat> original formula, ancient original formula, where a person declare the faith in the triple gem, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And clearly, we can see that there was no ceremony. This is individually, each, each individual, each person willingly out of confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha proclaim this to all those present during that particular meeting where the Buddha taught this sutta and the development subsequently a few thousand years we still remember that uh, in buddhist activities with uh, those following the theravada tradition you can see that before before an event an activity we will still first recite the sarana, taking refuges, the three refuges, also without a ceremony. But we have to understand that reciting the tisarana is individual. That is why the Pali formula Bodham Saranam Gachami is I go, I, I. It is the individual, each, each one, when you recite that, you say, I go to the Buddha for refuge. So that is the proclamation of faith. And that one is done together. But traditionally, it's individually. Because you, you feel with so much happiness that you decided to take the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha as your refuge, as your guide. And not only that, you want to tell everyone present that from this moment onwards, until my death, till the end of my life, I will take the triple gem as my guide. So this is the proclamation of faith. But in the development, as I mentioned, since this is so important that the Mahayana Vajrayana, they have developed ceremony, a specific ceremony to, it, it's kind of uh, to emphasize the importance of this proclamation of faith. You also have a, a group of people arranged that they do this together in a ceremony with a, a teacher normally, a monk or nun, representing the triple gem to accept this new Buddhist. Uh, it is not something extra actually, but it is a development which put emphasis on this proclamation and that traditions think that if you do it in a group, which they also have to say that I go to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, 
in their various languages and also they will say that till the end of my life also doing that but in the group following a certain order of ceremony which means that they emphasize on this and before they chant that i go to the buddha for refuge i go to the dhamma there is an explanation given to the group by the certifying master so that is why the first thing for a real buddhist if you claim yourself as a buddhist is to take the three refuges and that is the buddha the dhamma and the sangha and for Vajrayana, they also have the guru as an extra but the essence and the thinking is still the same the emphasis on the triple gem as our guidance for spiritual living until the end of our life so this is very significant for a buddhist whether through a ceremony or no ceremony the most important point is from deep inside your heart you say this out in public uh, you see people are very strange and they have different motivations there are people who follow a certain religion to get benefits to get networking to get businesses and so on but in buddhism it is always individual effort for spiritual development so by accepting the triple gem as the guidance for the whole life is we believe that this triple gem will help us to develop spiritually until eventually you have achieved your goal of deliverance so this is the purpose of the first very important belief for a real buddhist this is another very important teaching in buddhism and different from uh, a lot of indian religions as well as perhaps also chinese we believe in karma vipaka that means action and the reactions but again different people will have different understanding on this what is different between the cause and effect teaching in buddhism and many other religions they don't emphasize on the conditions whereas in buddhism we say the most important is not the cause actually the conditions why is uh, why did the buddha emphasize so much on the conditions because the outcome the outcome the reactions the ultimate result is actually dependent on the conditions and not just merely the action meaning that how the reaction actually manifests will actually depend on the condition and this point actually man, even many buddhists do not understand properly and i have also observed that in uh, many buddhist classes in sunday schools when the teacher try to explain this very difficult teaching about action reaction uh, some teachers will always take the shortcut and explain it like it, it's something like tit for tat kind of explanation or sometimes fatalism fatalism means something that is already fit, cannot change i i give an example chinese actually usually like to emphasize zhong gua de gua, zhong dou de dou, meaning that if you grow the seed of 
For example, melon, any type of melon. You sow the seed of melon, you will get melon uh, as the fruit. If you sow the bean, eventually you will get the bean tree and the beans uh, as a fruit, which is logical, not entirely right. Logical, but not entirely right. What is not right? Now, you may not believe or have not seen that we grow ears, uh, human ears, on white mice. You may not have seen that a different plant grow from another plant. This is called genetic engineering. So what is genetic engineering? It's nothing to do with the action. It is the conditions. If you manage to change the conditions, you will change the result. If we don't do that, there is no way of attaining enlightenment. You know, the cycle will be no end, which is fatalism. I kill you, you will kill me, action, reaction, equal. It will always repeat in this way, and forever there is no way of getting out from that cycle, there is no way of enlightenment. So the Buddha cannot teach this kind of karma vipaka relationship. So that is why the Buddha add the conditions. By adding the conditions, it will allow for different outcome. But then people will question, is that fair? Is that fair? If I kill you, sorry, if you kill me, I don't kill you back, then it may not be fair. So interestingly, Nagarjuna again, in Mahaprajna Paramita Sastra, explained the dilution theory. Dilution theory. He said, if you take, let's say, a palm full, eh? you grab a palm full of salt and put all this salt in a glass of water or in a container of water and you drink that, you'll be very, very salty. If you take the same amount of salt and then put it in a stream, and then you take a glass from that stream, it will not be salty. Equal is that amount of salt. But the taste will be different. Why? The condition has changed. Only by thinking in this way and explain in this way that it is possible for mundane people like us to achieve enlightenment. The chief reverend always saying that your karma cannot catch up with you. So that then you have a chance to achieve enlightenment before the karma catch up with you. Why? You make the condition that the bad karma will not happen. If not, then your action, reaction, action, reaction, it will go on and on and on, then there is no opportunity for enlightenment at all. There will be forever suffering following by suffering by a different party, then another suffering and suffering and suffering. So we emphasize that although we see karma vipaka in such way, the outcomes are still fair. For example, Deva Datta on the top of the hill throw a boulder down, wanted to kill the Buddha. This is a story. If you don't accept it, it is still okay. Then the guardian Deva hit that rock. And then a small splinter fell on the leg of the Buddha and then hurt the Buddha. So using that analogy, if you uh, maybe, let me see, 
three story, four story, and drop a stone, one kg. Yeah, still still can carry one kg. Okay, we can carry ten kg. One kg, you drop from four story, wanted to kill a person uh, standing there watching something. Yeah, from that height and so on. If it hit on the head, yes, you can kill the person. So one kg. So fatalism says that you will be killed by the other person using uh, maybe the same way, also by that stone. But dilution way of looking at it with your correct understanding and learning, the correct uh, understanding and learning, instead of kill by 1 kg, you can convert that 1 kg to many, many small pebbles. You will be hurt but not be killed. So only looking at karma in that way is a dynamic way. And then it is positively, positively developed spiritually. If it's fatalism type of explanation for karma and the effect, no way. That means uh, all the parties will be just continuing killing each other, hurting each other. So we cannot teach or explain karma vipaka in that way. So we have to be very careful, especially when we are teaching Sunday schools or giving, uh, trying to explain karma vipaka. You must include the conditions which will change how the reaction manifests. This is very important. Buddhists believe that there is cycle of birth and death, samsara, as well as your deliverance, mokha or moksha in uh, Sanskrit. We also believe the uh, samsara, so mundane beings, then the Nibbana, we have those who have achieved enlightenment, the Arahans, Pachika Buddha, and Samasam Buddha. And the way to connect or to achieve from Samsara, the cycle, to get up of the cycle, to achieve Nibbana, Buddhists has ways to do that through the practice of uh, sila, samadhi, and panya. So when we have the Eightfold Path, actually it's a com combination of the sila, samadhi, panya, but uh, stated in a different way. In fact, in his whole life of uh, teaching, the Buddha because meeting different type of listeners and audience. And these listeners and audience, they have a different understanding, spiritual attainment and background. He will use a different approaches in order to help them. So you can find that in the, mainly the Sutta Pitaka, in the Buddhist discourses, there are repetition, different suttas, highlighting the same theme, but sometimes in a slight different way, how he taught it. So the Buddhist way of uh, development, interestingly, start with faith. This is given in both the Pali Nikayas as well as the Sanskrit Agama. We can find this teaching that is in the sequence. First, you have faith. And a most important faith for a Buddhist is the taking refuge. Because this is the starting of your commitment, yourself, towards the development, your spiritual development starts by accepting the triple jack. So that is the beginning of the faith. 
But as Nagarjuna has pointed out, by this believing in the Buddha, forever you have no advancement except maybe more happiness. When you think of the Buddha, maybe you, you get some inspiration, so happiness, but it will end there. Of course, this happiness will help in Buddhism. When a person is happy, then that person is more willing to accept teaching. When a person is angry, nothing can go in. So it is important for Buddhists to keep your mind in a happy state instead of an agitated state. And this has been emphasized many, many times in the suttas, in different suttas. So that is why Buddhism is a happy religion in that sense. Happy religion. Buddhism, because again, some teachers, when they teach four noble truths, the first noble truth is about dukkha. Then you know the Sanskrit translation, translation into English, suffering. Into Malay, you know dukkha means miserable, sadness, and so on. Of course, uh, the Malay borrowed the word from Sanskrit. Huh? Dukkha chitta, and so on, the dukkha. And Chinese were still. Were still. When, when the dukkha, the Pali Sanskrit term, was translated into Chinese, they cannot find an exact word to match. Because I think... We are affected by our understanding based on translation and do not actually appreciate the essence of the original language. And also we miss out that the Buddha did not start explaining Dukkha by give definition of Dukkha, which is done commonly by a lot of teachers. Although it may be, you know, the first noble truth, but when the Buddha in the Sutta explained the three characteristics of life, which I will say later, I keep it a bit later, what I'm trying to emphasize to you that our understanding and belief based a lot on languages. How you first approach something new, the new concept or new word, and if you stick to your understanding, unfortunately, if your original understanding was wrong and you have no chance or you didn't meet somebody who can re-explain to you, re-educate you the correct meaning or significance of that particular term, you will forever stick with that term, thinking that your understanding is all the while correct. So the Chinese when translated is ku, fu, fu, ku, ku. You know Chinese, this ku has no positive connotation. I mean, you go and ask anybody. Ko, ko. Ha, ko, Hokkien ko. So, let's say if you don't understand Buddhism, put aside dukkha, yeah? If anybody mentioned to you call suffering, suffering, yeah, English suffering, dukkha, since when you get a positive understanding from all those terms I mentioned, no way. So if you start doing that to new Buddhists, all of them will scared and run away. But the Buddha is not nihilism. That means destroying everything type of teacher. So if you emphasize too much on the negative aspect and cannot give the correct emphasis of the original term dukkha, then we are all in trouble. So outsiders, if you emphasize, say, ah, suffering, 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 they will say Buddhism is a passive, nihilistic, destroying everything 
type of teaching and religion. So those who hate the world, who want to destroy everything, will believe in Buddhism. This is how they spread. Because in the first place, that means they have misunderstood Dukkha in the first place. But you, you, that's why uh, they, they amplify the negative aspect of that term Dukkha and miss out the positive to balance Dukkha, which will bring me to... Uh, okay, before I move on to the next. So, we faith is not good enough, we have to emphasize comprehension. That means if you believe in those things, you make sure that you understand what you believe and not just believe because you believe. And also by comprehension, it's not good enough. Yala, you get more knowledge, so what? That knowledge will not help you. It will turn out to be a book knowledge. You know, nowadays, the internet has so much. You can search anything about Google will help you to tell you. Now we're still AI coming in. So there will be a lot of information and knowledge. But those information and knowledge may just confuse you. So in order to move forward, in Buddhism, we say, take action, la. don't just stop at knowing only, or believe, then you know. You have to react, la. have to work on that. Since you believe that that is a Nibbana, that is a destruction of sufferings and so on, then there must be positive action towards your goal or what you believe. So that is the action or the cultivation aspect of it. And eventually, if it is done properly and correctly, you will have the attainment where you actually see it as it is. Yatha Buddha Dashtana. You, you see the thing as it is and not because you heard it like that. You actually know it like that and you attain. It is something like people tell you, okay, you want to go to Brickfields, you take this route, that route, like that, like that. Then you try to figure out, uh, okay, now, now you, you have your ways, uh, your, all these things. Uh, maybe easier. But again, that is just on, on the apps itself only. So you have to walk that path, following that path, whether it is uh, the root right or root wrong, and eventually your attainment is you actually reach the destination and see for yourself. So this is the process which starts from faith. So Buddhism does not disclude faith. However, it says that Buddhists should not stop by having faith. And then the faith has to be developed or the faith as a motivation help us to understand more and then with the understanding and your commitment the faith there you have to take action it is this action if taken correctly with the correct effort you will achieve what you intended So this is the very, very important thing. Characteristics of existence. Tilakana. Three form. Uh, the Buddha, when he explained Dukkha, never starts by saying everything is suffering. He will talk about impermanence meaning that things will change according to conditions it's impermanence this exists because of the condition so this disappear or broke down because of conditions so this is the essence and the most important teaching of buddhism so if you want to teach about Dukkha, please start with Anicca. Why? 
Because all of us have experience with Anicca. Uh, Dukkha, sometimes people will try not to accept. So not so realistic. Anicca, you cannot run away because you can actually see that happen. And there are already many, many examples in our daily living, our past experiences, in our growing. So how, what is the formula in the Sutta that the Buddha explained this tree? So because of impermanence, and we know why impermanence, because conditions changes. So once it changed the form, the manifestation, as I mentioned, the condition is so important, it will also change. And where does this suffering come from? Because we cannot accept it mentally. We always want something to be status quo. We always want something to be complacent in our, our uh, a zone of comfort. We, we don't want to change that. When you reach something, you are very happy with that. You hope that this will be permanent and forever. But since you cannot control a lot of conditions, so you cannot control the changes. So changes is a truth. Which satisfy just now I mentioned about the three tests. And because we cannot accept changes, therefore we create a lot of emotions. Simple. Huh? If you attach your attention very much to some object, if something happened to the object, you cannot accept that and it's going to affect you. Simple. Many, many examples. So this is his approach in the Sutta. So I don't know why you want to swap the order and try to be better than the Buddha to explain these characteristics just by isolating Dukkha and then give definition of Dukkha. Therefore, changing the whole emphasis. His idea is to link the three together so that we can see a better picture from Anicca in Dukkha and because of Dukkha, that is Anatta. Meaning that if you cannot control something, that something must not have its own uh, identity or, or its own existent entity. It does not control. Like us, we don't control. We are subjected to conditions. If you are not subjected to conditions, that means whatever changes, I don't care. I can maintain no change. So the Buddha said, after he surveyed and then uh, made emphasis, analysis, he found that none don't have. Don't have. Don't have something which forever cannot change. Because we believe that changing is the truth. So not changing is not the truth. But human being, through this uh, conditioning by many, many birth and death, so we, we keen, uh, we seem to be attaching and hope that there is an entity, whatever you call it, you call it Atman, you call it soul, you can call it anything that will not change, that can transfer from one life, from one period to another. So this is a wrong understanding. Even many Buddhists cannot accept this because they always ask the question, Buddhists believe Sangsara, so that is uh, birth and death. Then the question is, from one life, death, that is the ending. When there is a new life coming up, so it is a new beginning. And we always link, like the Buddha said, in my past life, so and so, what happened and what happened. 
So then we start to link up and say that, oh, this is the Buddha, this is the Buddha, this is the Buddha, this is the Buddha. The Buddha never say that in the Sutta at all. It's our thinking based on our attachment to forever, living forever kind of thinking and start doing the conditioning and think like that. This is the explanation. Because we need to explain about the vipaka, the reaction. If I did something wrong and then go and punish somebody who has a totally no connection, it will be unfair. If I did something good and then reward somebody, not reward me, it is also unfair. So this is where the connection comes in, talking about the same entity, life after life. Actually, it is not. There is no individual or entity that continues from life to life. Don't have. Because once an entity comes to the end of a certain period of life, the aggregate will break off. Then when the new life forming, how does it happen? It is the karmic energy that causes this with the right conditions. And then ignorance must be there. If there is no ignorance, there will be no rebirth anymore. You have broken the link already. So because of this karmic affinity, conditions will be made where you, you want the effect to take place. So must find a condition where the effect can take place. Good or bad doesn't matter, depending on the condition. And the linking with the previous life is because of ignorance. Actually, once the life in a certain period broke off already, a new life is formed. That new life, strictly speaking, is not connected to the previous one in terms of aggregate material. Don't have. The only similarity is the karmic affinity which continues until Nibbana. Otherwise, this will continue. So maybe I should give a simpler example for you to visualize this. Now, there is an old house, old house, dilapidated. So totally broke down. Then you build another house. The house can be bigger, the house can be smaller. But you give it the same name. And then people will think that it is the same house. For example, from a uh, human existence, then the next life becomes a deva. Then you say it is the same. In terms of... Uh, the stage, the aggregate, and so on is totally different. What is the same, the linking, is the karmic affinity. So, but our attachment to self, our attachment, the wrong thinking to self will lead us to think that it is the same. Just, just like uh, a lot of story we Manawatu about people... Uh, having done good deeds and then reborn in, in the heaven and they told the story what causes, what good karma has made them to be reborn in, in the heaven and then they start to link uh, previously I was uh, maybe a monk or a ascetic, a practitioner or uh, a king and so on so because I have done this, uh, maybe doing dana or, or sacrifice the life, and because of 
these good merits happen to reborn and telling the story, then we start to link. Thinking that when the person on earth of the last birth died, then some kind of soul or whatever name you call it, turned into the Deva, which is not right. The last mental energy, the thought moment, extinguished already, the karmic energy will force a new form coming up. And that new form, based on the condition, will be totally different from the previous one. So this is the correct understanding of rebirth, which we actually, uh, during the development of Buddhism and uh, the sectarianism period, different sects will try to explain how this happened and some of them created different names to try to explain what has changed and how they change. But once, if you try to bring in the understanding that from this life, this particular thing run to another life, you are wrong already. This is not Buddhism anymore. But if it is explained in a way that the new, new life in whatever form was due to conditions and not something permanent that can run here and there, then this is correct. The conditions that create with the karmic energy and the ignorant, because the cycle of birth and death is because ignorance. If no ignorance, then cut out already. So this is the correct understanding of rebirth. Okay, we now move on to how Buddhist or Buddhism see faith and connected to cultivation, uh, which is uh, important to Buddhists because we do not stop at just belief. Anguttara Nikaya, Book 7, Sutta no. 6. Anguttara Nikaya is a collection of suttas where in each section they will discuss about one topic, two topic, three topic, four topic like that. So this one in the seventh topic because it mentions seven main theme. Dana is treasure. So First of all, the Buddha already emphasized faith as first of the seven treasures. So Buddha put a lot of emphasis on faith. And it is our spiritual wealth for the noble one. So it's very important. And uh, besides that, that's why uh, Buddhism doesn't stop at just faith. The other treasures are moral virtue, sila, hiri, otapa, sutta. That means uh, in the olden days, they don't print books or don't write books. So the learning is through listening. The knowledge is obtained through listening. That's why sutta. Thirty-seven factors of enlightenment, Bodhipakya Tamma, very important cultivation aspects of Buddhism, because uh, in, in the Nikaya, we do not see, because Nikaya represent early stage of Buddhism, development of Buddhism, and the Buddha discuss about cultivation. In the discussion of cultivation, the most extensive one is these 37 factors of enlightenment, where the Buddha highlighted how a mundane person can reach enlightenment through various aspects of cultivation. And there are two related to faith, which is the 
five spiritual faculties and five strengths. Pancha Indrayani, Pancha Bala. And the first of the five spiritual faculties is faith. What I'm trying to show here is to see how important it is. And in the Samyukta Nikaya, uh, sorry, it's Samyukta, yes, Samyukta Nikaya, there is a particular section just talk about faith. Meaning that the Buddha actually spent some time discuss about faith and how faith can be applied to cultivation. Faith not as to stop at believing, but faith as a driving force to help you to develop in the spiritual cultivation. And again, faith doesn't stop there. It has the viriya, sati, samadhi, and finally panya. Just like what Nagarjuna has emphasized, that faith will allow you to learn Buddhism or learn the teaching of the Buddha, the Dhamma. That is the faith part. But you still finally need wisdom. Wisdom will allow you to differentiate what is real, what is not real, what is right, what is not right, and for you to move on until you reach enlightenment. So Panya is the last step. So what is the difference between faculties? Faculty is just like root, root. Because the Chinese translation give it gen, gen, just like the root of the tree in Riyani. So which is meaningful? Because if it is root, that means it can bring forth. It can generate. That is the meaning of faculties. So you start with the faith, then add on until finally panya. So uh, these five spiritual faculties will bring forth good qualities, will bring forth good merits. And when it is strong enough, it becomes five strengths with the same name, slightly different title, but same same five items. Then what is the difference between five roots or spiritual faculties versus five strengths? The five faculty is to give birth of all the good things and the five strengths is to destroy the bad things. They have different purpose. But actually the Buddha did use an analogy, very interesting analogy to describe about the relationship between the five spiritual faculties and the five strengths. Now, imagine that there is a stream following eastward. Because in India, most of the river are, are flowing towards east. The ocean following towards east. And in that stream there, there is a small island. So when you see water flowing in the stream with an island, it will split. It will split into two. So when the water split into two, it is still the same water. So when you look at the stream splitting into two, okay, so uh, north and south, north and south, when you look at the north and south, you see two water flowing. Uh, you cannot imagine. First, you have a stream. Inside there, you put an object, a small island. So because that island, a solid thing, will block the water and the water to flow through will split into two. So the top part is north, correct? North, then the downstream is east. The opposite bank is south. The source is the west. Because uh, if you, uh, Indian geography, 
the middle part and the north part is higher, higher ground. So that's why when the rivers in India flow, they will flow to the Indian Ocean is on the east side. So imagine that. Then if you stand on either side of the bank, yeah, the north and the south side of the bank, look back the river, then at that point you will see two lah, because split. But if you move further either to the west side or to the east side, you only see one flowing. So the Buddha explains that actually the five spiritual faculties and the five strengths, they can be one or can be seen as two. It can be seen like that. So very interesting. Okay, so this comes to my last slide, which I would like to summarize our discussion this morning and emphasize on the main point. In Buddhism, we look at faith as a motivational force that help to drive Buddhists in the spiritual path. Because if you are a committed Buddhist, so you, you, you have already committed to this spiritual path once you accept the Triple Gem in the real sense. Then this faith, when you are committed, will help to drive you to do all whatever necessary in the development spiritually. And Buddhists can stay in the spiritual path due to their conviction that the triple gem is the model for all Buddhists to lead a happy and meaningful life. As I mentioned, happy is important. Because if in any religion, make you not happy, then why you want to believe? You might as well don't believe that religion. If you practice correctly, you should be a better and happier person. And this has been emphasized that Buddhism is about attainment in this life and not the life after. That attainment may not be out of samsara, but at least you maintain a happy state. This is possible in this life itself while you are alive and not waiting uh, like some emphasize, you know, praise life after death. Now uh, you get your reward only after death and things like that, but not in Buddhism. Buddhism means if you follow the teachings, you should be happier than if you don't follow or you don't know. Before, before and after. So this is something that we believe strongly. And if it did not happen, then we have to uh, investigate what went wrong. Why we cannot achieve that happiness as mentioned in the suttas. Faith can be enhanced and purified to generate other good mental states for spiritual development, which we can see in several of the suttas. I did not list a lot. In fact, a whole chapter is talking about faith and how it will lead to higher attainment due to faith. But I did say that it is not solely because of faith, but because of faith, we are drawn to Buddhism, we are drawn to the Dhamma, Mm, I think a lot of people don't understand the term Dhamma. Dhamma comes from the root Tha, that means action. Hold. Hold. Something that can hold. What does it hold or what is something that can hold? It will support us so that we don't fall into the bad states. Anything that can support us so that we don't fall into the bad states 
is called Dhamma. So when we say Buddha, Dhamma, Dhamma, Sangha, so that Dhamma, it can be anything. Practices, methods, teaching that will prevent, that will support us from falling, from doing bad things. Uh, that is Dhamma. So uh, eventually, with the correct effort and persistence, we will reach our goal. So this is the faith in Buddhism. Thank you for your attention. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Dr. Lim, for the very uh, Are there any talk. questions? Yeah, we have about ah. 20 minutes for questions. Yeah, okay. Please uh, put your hands up. We pass you the mic. Okay, Dr. Lim, uh, good morning. Uh, when, you, when you mentioned just now that uh, until the end of my life, we should take the refuge until ah, the correct. end of my life. Mm. So what does it mean? Until the end of my life is uh, this life or until I attain enlightenment? No, this life. Because we talk about the entity doesn't continue. So in your next life, you may not be a human. Yeah, can be an animal. But uh, Buddhists believe that if you seriously take refuge in the triple gem, you will not fall into the woeful states because of your correct understanding and your action. It will not drag you down to, to the health to the hungry ghost or uh, and no, Asura is considered good animals. You you won't become animal. The three woeful states. Yeah. It's until this this life. Uh, thank you, Professor, for a very enlightening talk. I think um your talk has really contributed to my uh, understanding in explaining, say, karma and rebirth. Just by adding the word conditions, I think it makes a lot of difference to me. Because sometimes I cannot argue back, you know, as to why, you know, those people have done something so bad and yet they enjoy very good life. Yes, yes. So I think the adding of conditions uh, has really been enlightening for me. Uh, because some people argue, see, see, we can do all the bad things and yet we get away with it, whether previous life or current life. And also, uh, to me, the understanding of rebirth, karma and rebirth. Because I heard one monk actually say he doesn't believe in rebirth because there is no proof. Nobody came back and tell, uh, told you that he's actually, you know, has having an, another life. So thank you, Professor, for that very good talk. Just by adding the word conditions, it made a lot of difference to me. Thank you. Because uh, you can also see that uh, same action, but happening to another person, the outcome is different. By right, same action should, I mean, it's very strict fatalism type. Same type of action done, yeah? outcome different. So what makes the difference? The conditions. And most of the time, we may see partially condition, yeah, but we do not grasp the total condition. And the Buddha emphasized in the Sutta, only the Tathagatas can comprehend totally, <laughs> not us. I mean, that level is not easy. Only between Buddha and Buddha, that they can see the total, you know, the full picture the ability. So if we can't, but I think this is some positive, uh, positive explanation which makes sense. Sometimes whether you accept it or you don't accept it is another matter. Because in Buddhism, it's more personal. Cultivation is also personal. And we do not force it on people. Yeah. Because your enlightenment and mine, I, I cannot you know, pull along me, oh, very good. Then we all tag along with all the cultivators, with all the saints, and save a lot of our trouble, which is impossible. If that is possible, then the Buddha is telling a lie. There's no karma vipaka, totally. 
so it's impossible. Uh, good morning, uh. Uh, doctor here. Uh, okay, let him let him ask this. Uh, morning, Doctor Tan. Yeah, thank you for taking your time and effort to come all the way from Kampa to over here to deliver us a talk that is so inspiring and different, I think, in perspective. <coughs> uh, I think for me, the talk is very, very good in the sense that I think it gives a different perspective and a lot, a lot of better understanding for me. Uh, for me, the sada, the word sada or confidence uh, or faith, to me, I think I interpreted it differently. Uh, in Buddhism, I think sada means uh, experiential confidence rather than faith. Faith is the thing we do is something that you do not know yet. But sada means experiential confidence that you still have confidence because you experience it. Uh, I think Buddha do not want us to be uh, blindly believe in what he say. I think one sutta, if I remember correctly, he asked Ananda, Kalama. do you believe in me? Mm. Buddha, uh, Ananda said, uh, I don't believe in you yet. Uh, Buddha actually praised him for saying that, actually very good. And I think it also reflected in the Kalama Sutta that mm. don't simply believe in everything. Mm. You have to really uh, study it fully before you understand it. Uh, I think this is why I understand Salam in, I think, in, Buddhist, in Buddhism. And that, unlike in other religion, I think you have to just blindly believe, even though you don't believe in that. I think Amen Kara in saying that. Thank you. Religious belief is uh, quite complicated. And then it also depends on the development of that religion, the area, the culture, the history. So we will see the differences. One thing good is that in Buddhism, we are encouraged to discuss and ask questions. And from what we receive back, we will think about it and then uh, improve on that. If you think that it is practical to you, useful, you accept it. If it is not, then you just forget it. So that is something good. Uh, Dr. Lin, thank you for coming all the way from Kampa and give us a very interesting talk. Uh, <coughs> I just want, you are from Utah, isn't it? Yes. I just want to find out what is the status of this Buddhism in uh, Utah. I ask this because I had a friend, he was a, a lecturer in Ata College long ago. Uh -huh. I mean, more than that. 15 years of sin. Uh -huh. He was very active in promoting Christianity in uh, Ta College. Uh -huh. So, I just want to find out the status of uh, uh, Buddhism. I also. think the public do not know that Ta College today is called Ta UMT, University of uh, Management and Technology. It is different from Utah, which is a University of Tunggu Brahman. It's a different university totally. So in Utah, we have just this year established a Buddhist research center to develop research in Buddhism, particularly the local Buddhism, like history of Buddhism. In fact, uh, this region received Buddhism quite early. It may not be a state religion, but the regional area developed Buddhism quite early. In fact, some of the monks from China who took the sea route to India, instead of the Silk Road, they took the Sea Silk Road. Eh? That means through Indonesia, uh, through the Malay Peninsula, then go to India, the second route. Not only the Silk Road, study Sanskrit, in Java. That's why you see Brubudo. And slightly earlier than that, the northern part, which is today Kedah, uh, a few of the valleys, they have the remains of uh, Hinduism and Buddhism. But I, I look at images and the leftovers. 
most probably it is not a center like Indonesia. That means a Buddhist center. It's more like uh, these merchants, the Indian businessmen, while doing business in this region, brought along the Buddha images. And some of them sponsored some temples, but it did not develop uh, extensively like Indonesia. And so we established the Buddhist Research Center, first one in Malaysia, to do academic research. And uh, of course, we have a Buddhist society, but the Buddhist society is not as active as an MU Buddhist society. Uh, thank you again. Very interesting to know about Utah, the, the research center over there. So the research center is actually uh, students or uh, lecturers, uh, uh, or, or full time, or just like uh, just. This research center partially sponsored by YBBM, Yasan Belia Buddhist, as well as uh, Fo Kuang. Mm. And uh, once we got a grant, we have to send proposal about what we want to study, then that the principal researcher will be uh, our lecturers. Then the lecturers can engage students to collect data. It, yeah. Which are also doing maybe it's good to coordinate with other Buddhist associations which may be doing their research also. Like I think Naranda, they've done a lot of these things. You know. Possible. Yeah. So your effort because will be we, much we easier. Because we just started, I think, last month. Oh. Uh, so uh, in future, we can contact them yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and collaborate in the research work. Because I saw they published a lot of things, you know relating to the history of Buddhism in, in uh, Malaya. Yeah. So if you co cooperate with them, maybe it's much more fruitful and easier. Sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Lim, following up on that topic, uh, is it possible, are there any restrictions to universities doing uh, courses in Buddhism, like uh, the School of Philosophy or anything? Uh, no. But uh, is it just a subject or a program? Program means a degree. So if it is a degree, first of all, any university, private or public, we have to get the approval first to run a, a program so that you can uh, receive students. Mm. This is what is happening in Malaysia. Even private, we, we need to inform that we have uh, this program, then what are the contents? We have to send the syllabi and so on. And yeah, actually you, you can even ask something outside <laughs> what we discussed about faith. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, I don't come very frequently. So if you think something I can contribute and discuss with you, then just ask. Because uh, asking has nothing right or wrong. We may have different opinion, but at least we can learn from each other. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lim, for, for the talk today. Um, so talking about sada, right, or faith, I think as adults, uh, especially faith in religion, people only go to religion when they have problems or they, they, they are unhappy and they, they want a way out. La. I think people that are very happy, have all the money, they you know no time for religion. Um, but talking about kids, la, so um, ha when having young kids and want them to be um, uh, have affinity with the with Buddha Dharma, um, and of course develop faith as a, as a at a very young age. How how is the best way to explain to them? Because you don't want it to say hey, just believe, you know, have blind faith. Um, how, how is the, maybe not best way, but um, most suitable way lah for them to develop the faith in the Buddha Dharma? I think the best education is a family education. That while the child is growing, 
how we can inculcate the good values. And we can do that while the child is growing by bringing them along when we are doing charitable work, not necessarily in, in the society or in the temples and so on. Because Buddhism actually is a labeling. Good or bad has no label. It is a value. If we inculcate the good values in the children, they will grow up, become good citizens. So that is more important. If to have more systematic, maybe you can survey surrounding whether there are associations that run some classes. It is also good for the children to mix with other friends because nowadays families are smaller. They don't have uh, many peers similar age to play with, other children to play with, at least not at home. So once a week, if they can mix with others, I'm sure they want to attend. And if there are good programs in those associations, then they will play and learn from there. Then one thing to emphasize the learning is when they come back, maybe have a small talk and chat to emphasize on the good values and focus to help them to understand and see it. Thank you, Natalie. Very useful. Thank you, Mr. Lin. Very enlightened talk, although I close half my eyes, <laughs> but I'm listening. Okay, and I'd like the best part when you explain the Dharma. As what you say, many people have misunderstood the Dharma. Or we, it's not misunderstood, we do not understand in depth the meaning of the Dharma. And that's very, it's something like, oh, okay. Something that I have not thought about that, okay? Okay, my question is, at this era, I felt that um, now we are living this era, people are confused, many confused people. Many scammer people, many scammer everywhere there is a trap. And how do we educate our children? Whether to be kind, to believe people, or to be protective. Not everybody can have wisdom until they have reached a certain age. And how do we prepare our children for this kind of era? Same thing Thank like you. what I have uh, emphasized just now. A lot of parents don't talk with the children. I mean, if they are too small, they cannot understand. If you try to discuss deeper uh, topics with them, but when they grow up, teenagers, if they maybe even the higher primary school, standard five, standard six, form one, they have reached the age where the thinking, the thinking uh, ability will enable them to understand a lot of things. But they are a bit confused and not very good at that. So this is the part where you need the parents' guidance. Like when there is some issue happening uh, on news or heard from relatives and so on, we should do a brief summary so that they can focus on the main issues. So this will help a lot. And why i emphasizing on uh, discussion is because if we keep on don't discuss with the children, when the children grow up, eventually, if they have any problems and issues, they won't find us. They won't talk to us because we did not open up the platform for discussion. If from very small, you have talked to them, then when they grow up, they have uh, certain issues outside or in schools, the first one they see is talking with you. So this is the issue with the modern society because parents are too busy. They are focused on a lot of things and then neglect the mental as well as physical growth of the children. And Thus, may create issues when the children grow up. So, a lot of discussions, uh, even you create 
that discussion by bringing some topics to talk about will help that. I mean, since you brought up the topic means not very serious. Serious in the sense that it may not happen within the family. But we use that as teach them about values and how to think, how to differentiate things, which will help in the thinking process. Can you uh, let us know something about the, the standard of uh, Utah? I mean, how good it is and uh, how good are their graduates in the job market? Because like, like Ta College, uh, they are very famous for accountancy. Yes. So many, I mm. think, I was told once, uh, 80% mm. of the accountants mm. come from uh, sure. Ta College. You know? So mm. I want to know about the, the status and of... Uh, uh, the establishment of Utah is for the people. And we don't discriminate whether they are rich or poor. Once they achieve the minimum requirement as set by MQA, the Malaysian Qualification Agencies, we will accept them in as student. Meaning that it is not that difficult to study in Utah. And the fees is relatively lower than a lot of the private institutions in the Klang Valley. So for B40, M40, it will help them a lot. 50% of the students, they are the first in the family to enter a university. I think the private institutions in the Klang Valley charge three times our fee for similar courses. And uh, how the industry accept our graduates. We are the top three in the country for employability. Our employability rate is at least 96%, six after graduation. In fact, uh, we receive a lot of letters asking us to recommend the students, but we don't have students to recommend. They already wrap up. It is no point uh, blowing our trumpet. If you go to Talent Bank website, you can see the list there. It's the industry feedback, not we praising ourselves. Good morning, Dr. Lim. How do we explain anatta to children, yeah. to people? <laughs> Is, uh, how, how, how do we experience it? The way the Buddha explained it is in the negative aspect. Positive aspect, because if you want to explain anatta by a definition, it's going to be very difficult. So, anatta, soullessness, meaning something that cannot con uh, something that is not conditioned. Not conditioned means it can resist any changes. It is controlling itself. Not controlled by all other conditions. It will never change. So the Buddha said that you cannot cite an example that something that has this property so the soul example, that something that can, you know, continue from one life to another, the Buddha said doesn't exist. Although a lot of people wanted to think like that, but it does not exist. Of course, other objects that we can experience and see is easier to explain. So to small children, what we can do is just the characteristic of anatta. You see the cup, then the cup broken. 
so it changes because uh, there is a force somebody did something and changed it can you find something that even you do something it will resist and does not change it's difficult because changes itself is a truth and this the permanent nature is against the truth but human mundane people like us would like that permanent thinking and we always whatever it is link to that permanent Uh, our belongings, the objects that we have, we hope that we can retain them, relationship and other things as well. We always think that the longer the better. But if you look at the negative side, something that you don't like, like suffering, sickness, pain, is it the longer the better? No. Then you reverse. You say those that you don't like, you hope that it will disappear quickly and immediately. What is the consistency here? It is your mind that prefer to pick like this. In nature, it is never like this. So this is another way how we can describe things to help people to see. But to realize it, you are a Buddha. So that is finally part the realization that they know ah like that than an arahan or a Buddha. Yeah, th th thank you, Doctor Lim. Doctor Lim, there's a term called the Dharma follower and faith follower. So, oh, uh, 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 yeah, which is more predominant? Predominant in the sense of more people or more what? people, more people. Favor. Favor, all right. Yeah. But the. Yeah, yeah. Faith. Because I, I guess it's easier. Yeah. It's easier to follow by faith than actually the Dhamma. Thank you.